Good evening. Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome. My name is Moira McPherson. I'm the interim president and vice chancellor of Lakehead University, and I'm delighted tonight to be able to welcome you to Lakehead University and the Bora Alaskan Faculty of Law. As we begin this very special evening, I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of this land and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of Indigenous peoples. I would like to also recognize that Lakehead University's Thunder Bay campus is on the traditional land of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. I also acknowledge the history that many nations hold in this area and I look forward to respectful relations with the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in the spirit of reconciliation. This evening, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for the Bora Alaskan Distinguished Lecture Series, Mr. Brian Greenspan. Mr. Greenspan is one of the most prominent and well-regarded defense lawyers in Canada. He received his BA from the University of Toronto in 1968 and his LLB from the Osgoode Hall, of, Osgoode Hall Law School in 1971. He was awarded the Laid Law Foundation Fellowship and received his LLM from the London School of Economics in 1972. Mr. Greenspan was called to the bar in 1974 and taught at Osgoode Hall for seven years while also serving as a special lecturer in criminal law at the University of Toronto's Law School for 14 years. He has served as counsel on many of Canada's most significant cases that have helped shape criminal law over the last four decades. A fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and the International Society of Barristers, he is sought after for his sage advice in respect of international cross-border investigations and criminal, and trial, criminal trial and appellate matters. He has been recognized by his peers in the international who's who of business lawyers in business crime, the best lawyers in Canada, and Chambers Canada since their inception. And he has been twice named as one of the 25 most influential lawyers in Canada by Canadian Lawyer Magazine. He received the G. Arthur Martin Medal for contributions to criminal justice in Canada in 2010. In 2012, he was recognized by the Law Society of Upper Canada with an honorary Doctor of Law degree. And in 2013, he was awarded the Alumni Gold Key for Achievement by Osgoode Hall. But most dear to his heart, Mr. Greenspan received the key to the city of Niagara Falls, his hometown. Mr. Greenspan is the past president of the Criminal Lawyers Association in Ontario and the founding chair of the Canadian Council of Criminal Defence Lawyers. He is a member of the Ontario Regional Committee of the Supreme Court Advocacy Institute and a member of the Board of Directors of the Innocence Canada Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's Boralaskan Distinguished Lecture Series speaker, Mr. Brian Greenspan. Thank you so much. 
I am greatly honored and humbled by the opportunity to address you as the second Bohr Alaskan Distinguished Lecturer. As a professor, a liberal jurist, and committed civil libertarian, Bohr Alaskan brought to every challenge a legal intellect that has seldom, if ever, been matched in the history of our country. As the United States Supreme Court Justice Benjamin Cardoza observed in defining his role as a judge, his duty was to objectify in law not his own aspirations, convictions, and philosophies, but the aspirations, convictions, and philosophies of the men and women of his time. The task of the judge was the task of a translator, reading the signs and symbols read in sympathy with the spirit of their times. Few people, if any, have brought to the task of a judge a greater devotion, dedication, and commitment to the principles of fairness and decency than Borlaskin. But Borlaskin was not a one-dimensional scholar and jurist. He was an engaging colleague and a conversationalist. Of even greater significance, he was a committed sports fan. And like my family, had virtually a singular devotion to baseball. In fact, while at high school in Fort William, urban legend reports that he hit the longest home run in the history of the Lakehead. Shortly after Laskin had been appointed Chief Justice of Canada in 1974, Harry Arthurs, the esteemed former dean of Osgoode Hall Law School and later president of York University, was visiting Thunder Bay. He asked his taxi driver to make the mandatory pilgrimage to Laskin's furniture store, then operated by Bora's brother Saul, who then was the new mayor of the amalgamated Thunder Bay. Arthur's apparently turned to the taxi driver and asked whether he remembered Bora Laskin. The taxi driver paused and then replied, yes I do, hell of a baseball player, whatever happened to him? <laughs> Bora Laskin's contribution to legal scholarship and his progressive dissents on matters of social policy are both connected to the theme of my remarks this evening, and justice for all, the future of the adversarial system in Canada. Chief Justice Laskin was the epitome of Canada's cultural mosaic. Born in Fort William in 1912, of immigrant parents who had arrived in Winnipeg in 1908, he proudly appreciated his European Jewish roots and maintained his sense of ethnicity and respect for his family's origin. Unlike the American melting pot, he took pride in Canada's policy of encouraging immigrants and their descendants to maintain important aspects of their ancestral cultures and to resist the temptation of complete assimilation into the North American way of life. If he needed a reminder of his ancestry, he found it early in his life, when despite his quite extraordinary academic record, he was unable to find work at any notable law firm in Toronto due to the anti-Semitism that pervaded the English-Canadian legal profession at the time. Despite the requirement that he serve as a student at law with a member of the bar, he had difficulty finding a lawyer who would serve as his principal, as non-Jewish lawyers would not accept Jewish students. That personal challenge likely affected his enduring commitment to equality. It certainly influenced my family, who arrived in Niagara Falls as Jewish immigrants from Europe 20 years after the Laskin family and faced similar manifestations of blatant discrimination. Our nation, a synthesis of our indigenous communities, the French and English settlers, and subsequently the global ingathering of the exiles, many escaping poverty and oppression, adopted as the legal system which Canadians would use to settle and resolve both criminal and civil disputes, the adversarial process, a system linked to Britain and used in common law countries, where two advocates represent their party's position before judge or a group of people, a jury, who attempt to determine the truth and pass judgment. 
a system which stands in stark contrast to the inquisitorial process where a judge investigates the case from the outset, a system which traces its roots to medieval justice, trial by combat, and which, unlike the inquisitorial process, where the defendant may be compelled to give evidence, preserves the right to silence. A system in which testimonial trustworthiness, the credibility and veracity of the case against an individual, is tested by cross-examination, the engine by which the adversarial character of the common law is driven. A system in which objection is taken by the adversaries to the relevance and admissibility of evidence in order to ensure fair play and due process. A system in which a frustrated English judge once remarked, am I never to hear the truth? To which counsel replied, no, my lord, merely the evidence. <laughs> How was it that our cultural mosaic chose to adopt and adhere to the adversarial process, essentially a British invention? To some, <clears throat> to some extent, the answer may be found in Professor Porter's iconic treatise, The Vertical Mosaic, which was published in 1965, which was the first year I attended university as, a, as an undergraduate at the University of Toronto. And Porter's book became an instant classic. Professor Porter advanced the thesis that Canada's mosaic, comprised of different ethnic, linguistic, regional, and religious communities, were unequal in status and power. His study revealed that some groups, particularly those of British origin at the time, had the advantage of better income, occupation, health, and education when compared to those of Eastern and Southern European origin, and that Canada's indigenous population were obviously the most disadvantaged. According to Porter, this vertical arrangement also applied to power and influence in the decision-making process, whether bureaucratic, economic, or political. Fifty-three years later, that portrait of Canada which Porter exposed is not only being subjected to sober second thoughts, but to a serious attempt to reevaluate our justice system and to incorporate historical lessons which have largely been ignored and unheeded. It is an attempt to make our justice system more responsive to our diverse community, to make our system more accessible and efficient, to instill a sense of confidence that justice will not only be done but will be seen to be done. The priorities and complexities of modern society have dictated a critical evaluation of the effectiveness of the adversarial system of justice. But per perhaps before predicting the demise of that system, or even a diminished role in the administration of justice in Canada, permit me an opportunity to explain why Laskin's generation, and indeed my generation, were committed to adversarial justice and the belief that it produced the fairest and most effective technique to arrive at the truth and oftentimes a just result. Past generations appreciated the intensity of the adversarial process, the drama of the courtroom, romanticized by playwrights and in the history of film. Witness for the prosecution, 12 angry men inherit the wind to kill a mockingbird, and indeed, and justice for all, all of which heroically chronicle the advocate in the quest for that just result. The confrontation between the combatants in the adversarial process has always relied upon oral persuasion. I have almost obsessively read with admiration and respect the oral oratorical flourish of the great oral advocates. I have attempted to emulate, if not shamelessly plagiarize, their most memorable and remarkable addresses to the jury. More than 40 years ago, in a collection of articles in tribute to Arthur Maloney, one of Canada's most inspiring orators and oral advocates, criminal appeals in Canada were described as essentially an oral phenomenon. That tradition stood in almost inspiring contrast 
to the trend in the United States to limit or indeed eliminate oral presentation. There was, in Canadian courts, a widely held view that oral persuasion accounted for the difference in outcome in a significant majority of cases. Those assumptions, which then accurately describe the centrality of oral argument, particularly to appellate success, led to certain accepted conventions in the manner in which submissions were prepared and presented. Well, nothing is permanent but change. Although some and increasingly few of us nostalgically recall the elegant development of a submission patiently nurtured by Justice G. Arthur Martin's wisdom, or the more aggressive debates with Chief Justice Charles Dubbin in the 70s and early 80s when appellate advocacy in Ontario could take the form of the Talmudic advancement of truth through piercing questions unrelated to the form and content of written submissions, the reality is that those timeless debates are now an historical footnote in the evolution of advocacy. That doesn't mean that many of the underlying principles which guided the effective advocate have been abandoned. Change doesn't mean that all truths are out of fashion, only some. There are constant principles which govern the art of persuasion. Although I don't subscribe to the fatalistic notion that argument seldom convinces anyone contrary to their initial inclinations, persuasion now requires a more focused, more abbreviated presentation, dependent on less oratory and greater precision. Particularly appellate courts have little patience for a review of the historical development of a principle unless it is critical to the policy underlying a position. There is a clear disinclination for courts to suffer through even minutes of less than useful rhetoric. John Laskin, Bor Laskin's son, retired this month after an extraordinary and distinguished career as a Justice of the Court of Appeal of Ontario. He perpetuated the Laskin legacy for compassion, decency, and intellectual honesty. In May 1998, John Laskin authored an article which has become the definitive guide to appellate advocacy. It was called A View from the Other Side, What I Would Have Done Differently If I Knew Then What I Know Now. And it ushered in the dawn of a new era of appellate advocacy in Canada. He observed that the most effective advocates forget the introduction and the summary of the facts. Instead, they got to the issues almost immediately. The facts were best argued in the context of the issues, and in most appeal, Justice Laskin urged counsel to forget the wind-up and make the pitch. To further advance our shared affection for baseball, the Laskin metaphor should be expanded. What has become painfully clear is that you should throw strikes. Curves are seldom tolerated and never appreciated and you keep your body toward the plate and never but never balk. If an appeal can be defined as one court showing its contempt for another, our courts are no longer timid in the expression of their corrective function. Judicial language has become more direct and less reverent, so too the language of oral persuasion. That's not to suggest discourtesy nor disrespect, but rather a sense of clear purpose and clear language. Will Rogers quipped that the minute you read or hear something you can't understand, you can almost be sure it was drawn up by a lawyer. <laughs> that may once have been true, but no longer. Simplicity, lucidity, and now velocity are attributes more valued and admired than passionate oratory or rhetorical flair. Franz Kafka observed that a lawyer is a person who writes a 10,000 word document and calls it a brief. <laughs> but the brief has become a critical element of adversarial persuasion. And as a result of the increased importance of written submissions, judges are better informed of the issues in advance of oral argument and more likely to have reached at least a preliminary assessment 
and to have focused on the areas of concern. The effective advocate has become a good listener, aware of the composition of the panel, attempting to anticipate the court's inclinations and preconceptions, answering questions and concerns directly and without needless delay or commentary. The adversarial process has become more civilized and concurrently has introduced a less confrontational and compromise as opposed to combat. Justice Felix Frankfurter once critically observed that to some lawyers, all facts are created equal. To some counsel, all arguments are created equal. And with almost parental pride, they, as was said in Macbeth, strut and fret their hour upon the stage filled with sound and fury, signifying nothing. But the smell of the grease paint and the roar of the crowd, which once motivated searing and insightful cross-examinations, and propelled counsel to persuasive excellence, may have been weakened, if not emasculated, by the digital world of written argument. Nevertheless, even in a diminished adversarial setting, the role of the defense is, and must be, to take the defendant's side, not the side of abstract justice or efficiency, or of society's interest, or even of objective truth, those are all vital concerns, needless to say, but they are not the defense lawyer's concern. The entire justice system may well be focused, at least in theory, on those values, and rightly so. But the defense lawyer must only be focused on the accused. The defense lawyer serves society and the abstract justice and objective truth simply by serving his or her client. The role of the defense is pivotal to the future of adversarial justice, which we have embraced as the best process to guarantee our liberty in a free and democratic society. In repressive regimes, there is no independent defense bar. The certain signal of the onset of oppression is when the state attempts to suppress the defense. Hitler, Stalin, the Chinese cultural revolutionaries, all placed defense lawyers, especially those most vigorous and independent, high on their respective hit lists. A robust defense bar is the scourge of totalitarianism. The emphasis in a free society is, of course, the antithesis of state control. Under our adversary system, the interests of the state are not absolute or even paramount. The dignity of the individual is respected. Even when a citizen is known to have committed a heinous offense, the individual must nevertheless be accorded fundamental rights constitutionally enshrined in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The right to counsel, to trial by jury, to due process, to the privilege against self-incrimination, to trial within a reasonable period of time, and to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. A criminal lawyer can never be excused for accepting a client's confidence and betraying it by a half-hearted defense. Project yourself for a moment into the position of an accused. I can assure you that our client list could well include your neighbors, your friends, your family, your classmates. If you should one day find yourself accused of a crime, you would expect your lawyer to raise every defense authorized by the law. Even if you were guilty, you would expect your lawyer to ensure that the state did not secure your conviction by unlawful means. You would be justifiably outraged if your lawyer sat silent while the prosecution deprived you of your liberty on the basis of an abusive investigation, perjure testimony, or a coerced confession. In the movie, and Justice for All, Al Pacino was cheered by the audience within the movie, and likely in countless movie theaters across Canada, for the betrayal of his client when he announced to the jury that his client was guilty. Surely that's not the kind of lawyer you would want. You would scarcely want your counsel to decide the defects in the prosecution's case were technicalities and that our community would be better served if you were in prison. The most unpopular defendant charged with the most unpopular crime has the right to expect the same kind of defense that you would want for yourself or for your children. 
That has been the abiding strength of the adversarial system, which transcends the passions and emotions which violence or corruption understandably evoke. No person accused of a crime should have to pass a trial of conscience engineered by his own counsel in addition to the trial faced in the courtroom. One trial for one accusation is certainly more than enough. We should have little tolerance for lawyers who establish limits other than those set by their own skills in determining the type of case that he or she will defend. It is permissible to decline a case involving a ship lost at sea because you don't know enough about admiralty law. You may not be able to fit some cases into your court calendar. You're certainly free to decide not to engage in the practice of criminal law at all. But a criminal lawyer who refuses to act for an alleged organized criminal, a corporate accused, a businessman, even in my position, a neo-Nazi, a communist, a hell's angel, an alleged murderer, a bank robber, a tax evader, or someone accused of crimes against women, children, or the environment, is in my view simply wrong. It is tantamount to a physician who would refuse, as a matter of principle, to treat someone suffering from leprosy or from AIDS. It is adversarial justice without an adversary. It is adversarial justice without justice. The legendary American advocate Clarence Darrow once said to a jury, I shall not argue to you whether the defendant's ideas are right, are right or wrong. I am not here to defend their opinions. I'm here to defend their right to express their opinions. Criminal lawyers defend clients, not crimes. It is our duty to act for an accused political terrorist. It is not our duty to act for political terrorism. The Charter of Rights mandates that every person has a right to retain and instruct counsel. Every individual is guaranteed an advocate, a champion against a hostile world, a single voice upon which he or she must rely with confidence that their interests will be protected to the full, fullest extent, consistent with standards of professional conduct. But the future of that once resonant voice is changing in our changing world. That voice has, at least to some extent, been muted by plea bargaining, by mediation, by conciliation and reconciliation, by diversion, and by the written word outperforming oral persuasion. This search for alternatives to traditional adversarial dispute resolution has found favor with the judiciary, the government, and the public, partially because it's responsive to common problems experienced with justice systems globally. Increased demand and increased expenditure in an era of fiscal and political restraint. Increased complexity in the prosecution of commercial crime and the costs associated with forensic investigation. Increased self-representation precipitated by the reduction of funding for legal aid and other public defender options. Increased volume of materials as a consequence of the constitutional requirement of full disclosure by the prosecution. Increased constitutional challenges to the propriety of searches, the propriety of police conduct, and to the legitimacy of legislation. And as a result, increased delay resulting from these multitude of factors and the culture of complacency, a description coined recently by the majority in the Supreme Court of Canada's transformational judgment in Jordan, a dramatic and singular response to delay. The increased demand by victims for a voice in the system, victims who complain of a lack of respect and recognition a lack of input and engagement, a lack of comprehension of the process and the apparent insensitivity of the adversarial system. All of these factors have led to demands for simpler and more responsive techniques to smooth the sharp edges of adversarial justice. Permit me a, a brief detour from probing the fate of our search for truth and justice 
in an adversarial system. I have just spoken of the increased demands placed on the administration of criminal justice in Canada. I have repeatedly used the word increased. But the one relevant factor to which I have not yet averted and to which the word increase does not apply is Canada's crime rate. Despite popular belief and perhaps conventional wisdom, and despite tough on crime policies which seem politically attractive and stimulate the press and the public to demand harsher penalties and greater crime control, statistics unequivocally demonstrate that there's been a downward trend in police reported crime since the rate peaked in 1991. Canada's crime rate had fallen to a 25-year low in 2006 when the Crime Severity Index, which measures both the volume and seriousness of police reported crime, was introduced and at that point it was assigned a base index of 100. 2006 equals 100 at the 25-year low. Ten years later, in 2016, our crime severity index was 71, 29 percent lower than a decade ago. At 5,224 incidents per 100,000 population, the total volume of police reported crime without consideration of severity was 28 percent lower in 2006. These are statistics depressing to most criminal lawyers. <laughs> and, dis and despite a 10% increase in Canada's total population between 2005 and 2015, the actual number of criminal code violations fell over 20% during that period, from 2,361,974 in 2005 to 1 million 863,675 in 2015. Homicides fell during that 10-year period from 663 across Canada to 604. In every category of violent crime, Canada has become a significantly safer place to live in the past decade and an incredibly safer place than when we were born. In the phrase authored by Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli of Britain, but popularized by Mark Twain, it has been said that there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> Nevertheless, the numbers I have cited do not lie. They're taken from Statistics Canada, and although perhaps counterintuitive, they speak the truth of the reality of crime in Canada. But why this deviation from the central theme of my remarks? Because it should be made clear and unequivocal. The demand for reform, the pressure on adversarial justice, the clarion call for alternatives to our existing system has nothing to do with increased crime and much to do with cost and complexity. And perhaps on one positive note, it may have something to do with social justice and a realignment of Porter's vertical mosaic in which access to power, influence and justice may be on a more level playing field, perhaps to be described as a, horizon a horizontal mosaic or at least a more egalitarian prospect of a circular mosaic. Of cost and complexity are two of the primary culprits in fueling the demand for less time-consuming and less confrontational approaches to dispute resolution. The patriation of our Constitution and the creation of our Charter of Rights added significantly to both cost and complexity. Chief Justice Laskin, the Court's most vocal dissenter, had also been the most forceful and persistent voice in favor of patriation and of ensuring that equality and principles of fundamental justice were respected and enforced. His dissenting opinions, as has been said of Holmes and Brandeis in the United States, cast beams 
that lighted the subsequent ways of the law. April 17, 1982, less than two years before Chief Justice's death at the age of 71, which was shocking my age today, was finally the moment when the most fundamental laws of the land were capable of amendment and recourse, without recourse, to the Parliament of the United Kingdom. The primary focus that day, as many of you may recall, was patriation. But to those of us engaged in the practice of criminal law, it was not patriation which was central. It was the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which had finally constitutionalized those fundamental principles of justice which had notionally been recognized in the Diefenbaker Bill of Rights, but which had failed to measurably impact on the administration of criminal justice. It was the Charter, as expressed by another Trudeau, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, which would define the kind of country in which we wish to live and guarantee the basic rights and freedoms which each of us should enjoy as a citizen of Canada. There was an inspirational quality to the entrenchment of the Charter at that stage of Canadian history. It was, as Mr. Trudeau observed, not so much a completion of our task, but the renewal of our hope. Not so much an ending, but a fresh beginning, with the willingness to share the risks and grandeur of the Canadian adventure. With the Charter as our guide, and a Supreme Court led by Chief Justice Brian Dixon, Laskin's successor, the scope and impact of Charter jurisprudence far exceeded the modest expectations of liberal principles and conservative reform. The Charter became the beacon for societal reform. In my lifetime as a criminal lawyer, there has been no case which has had greater impact on the professional life and practice of law than Justice John Sapinka's 1991 judgment in Stinchcombe. Until that point in our jurisprudential history, disclosure in a criminal case had been sporadic, inconsistent, oftentimes ungoverned. Frequently, the availability of disclosure depended primarily on who you were and where you were. Once you had earned a reputation for honesty and integrity, it was occasionally possible for defense counsel to actually be provided with Crown material, but almost inevitably under close supervision. At best, you were afforded an opportunity to quickly jot down notes of the salient evidence outlined in the Crown dope sheet, as, a, as occurrence reports were then endearingly called. It was an appropriate designation because the level of information revealed frequently left you without sufficient information. To, to truly provide full answer and defense. We were dopes because we lacked critical disclosure, and perhaps more damning, we were dopes because we simply accepted it. Stinchcombe gave new meaning to the requirement of providing the accused with the means to make full answer and defense. It transformed a system in which most counsels sat across from the Crown while the prosecutor selectively advised what was or may have been in their brief, and transformed it to a system in which full, complete, timely, and meaningful disclosure was what criminal justice in Canada required. The practical application of Stinchcombe has been far-reaching. Canada no longer suffers from the widespread practice still in existence in the common law world of late disclosure and trial by ambush. Counsel must be provided sufficient time to know the case and make decisions in a thoughtful and timely way. Full disclosure, in some case, triggers instructions from a fully informed accused to resolve the cases in an effective and efficient manner, a guilty plea. However, in some cases, it creates inefficiencies by requiring multiple appearances, the monitoring of disclosure process, and the potential of frustrating the entire system by unreasonable delay. Nevertheless, it would be difficult to suggest that constitutionally mandated disclosure has not advanced the prospect of a more balanced and even-handed criminal justice system in which the adversarial playing field is significantly more level than in the pre-Stinchcombe era. Balance and fairness 
breeds respect for our justice system, the fundamental principle which the Charter was meant to promote. Section 8 of the Charter, the right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure, it acts as a limitation on the powers of the state in exercising its authority. It protects our reasonable expectation of privacy. There is a mountain of litigation which evidences the competing principles of privacy and public accountability. The appropriate standard of proof to establish grounds for a search, the seizure of blood samples and other bodily fluids, border searches, consent searches, vehicle searches, warrantless searches, search incident to arrest, search incident to detention, electronic surveillance, computer searches, and the search for subscriber information. Another robust area in charter lit litigation is the application of Section 7 to the notion of abuse of process. A trial court has the power to stay proceedings to prevent the abuse of a court's process through oppressive or vexatious proceedings. That would be where compelling an accused to stand trial would violate those principles of fundamental justice which underlie our sense of fair play and decency. And although there was pre-existing common law jurisprudence relating to abuse, the constitutionalization of fundamental principles provided a more effective platform for the pursuit of the ultimate remedy. Charter litigation, disclosure, search and seizure, abuse of process, and countless other categories of constitutional challenge, far-reaching, creative, and fundamental to the principles of a free and democratic society, but costly and complex in a justice system which is underfinanced and screams out for efficiencies and inevitably attempts to improve the efficacy of the adversarial process by encouraging compromise, by narrowing issues, by placing time limitations on oral submissions, by judicial intervention when, when counsel aren't getting, to the, the, aren't getting to the point with appropriate speed. How do these constraints impact the adversarial process? How do these efficiencies either improve or undermine the quality of adversarial justice? They do not disturb the fundamental precepts of the presumption of innocence or proof beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal cases. But I believe there has been a chastening effect on the independence and creativity of counsel and controlled by the judiciary of the freedom once exercised by the combatants to do as Shakespeare described in Taming of the Shrew, as adversaries do in law, strive mightily, but eat and drink as friends. There has been a subtle but perceptible transference of the balance of power in the courtroom from counsel to the historically neutral arbiter in the adversarial process, the presiding judge. The judge has become the protagonist in the courtroom drama. The warning authored by a less than reputable American lawyer, the infamous Roy Cohn, that I don't care what the law is, I only care who the judge is, may have gained even greater traction. It is the judge who increasingly, increasingly sets the timetable, increasingly supervises and controls the purported excesses of counsel and the direction of the argument. The phrase, but counsel, this is what I'm interested in knowing, has become a trademark of judicial advocacy, which despite being arguably an improvement on the adversarial search for truth, is nevertheless a departure from the more independent role that counsel has historically played. The tension, the pressure cooker, the combat between counsel has to some extent been surrendered to the judge or an appellate panel of judges. And in moving in that direction, the adversarial system may well have become more inquisitorial and less distinct from the continental system of justice. Although it may be, or I'm sorry, although it may not be necessary for counsel to reclaim the center court in order to ensure the vitality of adversarial justice, we must nevertheless ensure that the right to counsel is meaningful and that the voice and position of the parties, whether civil or criminal, remains the defining feature in the search for truth. Cost, 
complexity, and social justice. This third element, social justice, challenging a system that many Canadians contend may no longer be acceptably responsive to our diverse community. We live in a nation of over 35 million inhabitants, spread over the second largest geographical national entity on the planet, in which our socioeconomic future is not and should not be the vertical mosaic. Those of British origin are a minority. Canadians who trace their origins even to common law jurisdictions are now a minority. The roots of more than 5% of Canadians are South Asian. The roots of more than 5% of Canadians are Chinese. And the roots of almost 5% of Canadians are Indigenous, a combination of First Nations, Métis and Inuit. Our racial and cultural diversity will unquestionably be further augmented by immigration and population growth. How does and how should this diversity impact upon our adversarial system of justice, a system so foreign to the ancestral systems of justice historically practiced by the majority of Canadians? We must be sensitive to the reality that many Canadians have been oppressed and marginalized. We cannot and should not permit our justice system to perpetuate that marginalization. However, it is difficult to accept that our diversity should dictate different systems of justice within our community. That justice for all should be interpreted as justice tailored to the distinctive communities within Canada. It is of critical importance to adjust our process to respond to our cultural mosaic. But to abandon the adversarial system in favor of a fractured justice system would be both chaotic, inconsistent, and fundamentally unjust. We can and must incorporate an understanding of our diverse cultures into our adversarial process so that we may, as I said at the outset of my remarks, reflect in our justice system the aspirations, convictions, and philosophies of the men and women of our time, which must be read in sympathy with the spirit of our time. The adversarial system of justice in Canada can be read in sympathy with the spirit of our time. The adversarial system has had the flexi flexibility to innovate, has had the capacity to utilize sentencing circles in the determination of a proper and fit sentence for Indigenous offenders, has been able to incorporate Gladue principles in relation to bail hearings, firearms prohibitions, dangerous offender hearings, parole, civil contempt, extradition, military justice, review board hearings, and professional discipline. We should be prepared to expand these considerations to other cultural minorities and to integrate into our model of justice the distinct and unique features of their heritage, which should, which should lead to a more compassionate and responsive system. Clarence Darrow once commented, laws should be like clothes. They should be made to fit the people they serve. At its core, though, adversarial justice, in my view, should be maintained and promoted. It should be better explained and its benefits more effectively broadcast. Canadians should realize that our justice system is not broken. Renovations may be necessary, but it is not a teardown. Canadians should understand that the presumption of innocence, the right to silence, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the right to disclosure of the case for the prosecution, challenging the admissibility of evidence, the right to counsel, the right to a jury trial, are all triumphant attributes of the adversarial system of justice and ultimately ensure fairness for all Canadians. Clarence Darrow also observed that justice has nothing to do with what goes on in a courtroom. Justice is what comes out of a courtroom. What comes out of Canadian courtrooms is worth preserving, and the vitality and currency of the adversarial process worth nurturing.
So I think we have time for just a couple of questions. We have a reception following the uh, talk tonight down in the library, and we would invite all of you to join. So we'll quickly take a couple of questions. And we have a microphone. So if you could put, raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone over to you. Okay, we have one over here. Oh, thank you. Laura Laskin was born just down the street from where my family home was. And my understanding is that prior to his tenure as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the guiding philosophy of determining guilt was, were the, uh, was the word of the law strictly adhered to. And he, in fact, persuaded the court to, to think of it as was, what, is, was what he did, what, what the, the guilty person, what he did, or the presumably guilty person, was this a reasonable action done by a reasonable person? Would you agree with that? Uh, I, 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 I want to take exception to your description of Laskin uh, to begin <laughs> with. Uh, I don't think that that, I don't think that, um, first of all, at no point in, Cana in the history of Canadian justice, uh, have we ever had anything other than a presumption of innocence? No, I, no, I appreciate that. But uh, if you, uh, in terms of reasonable action, I don't think that it's Laskin that injected that concept into Canadian law. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he was a civil libertarian, and he he was someone who um, I think interpreted law in a reasonably liberal fashion. Uh, but if you look to the history of his dissents, his, his dissents were very much um, dissents for in, that ultimately became the law of the land. Uh, in other words, that's why I said he can be compared to uh, Brandeis uh, and uh, um, in the United States and Oliver Wendell Holmes in the United States, because very much their dissents in the United States ultimately became the law. So there's a variety of cases where he was the great dissenter, and then 15 or 20 years later, everybody caught up to Laskin. Uh, and so Laskin's visionary sense of, of where justice ought to go in Canada uh, was picked up and now is the law of the land. I doubt very much whether there's a single judgment that he, where, where he dissented that hasn't ultimately been adopted as a matter of social policy in this country. So I, I, I don't think that... Uh, I, I don't think it's right to say that he authored uh, a change in criminal responsibility. I don't think he authored a change uh, in the way in which we approach uh, those who are accused of crime. Uh, and, and, but we have to keep in mind that we have a system where, unfortunately, uh, or a process today, where there is a, a noisy press out there and the public pick up that noisy press and the views expressed by the press uh, and the, the image of criminal justice in Canada um, is one in which uh, the criminal, so-called criminal, is vilified along with their criminal lawyer often. You know, uh, we're, we have a, a bit of a thick skin about that and we, we, we can handle it, I think. Uh, but during that vilification process, what we, what we have is what we always have to remember are accusations, allegations, people charged, not people who are guilty. With all due respect, and I have enormous respect for the victims of crime, but there isn't a victim until someone's convicted of the crime. All there is up to the time of the time that someone uh, has been convicted is we have a strong allegation. We may have a, a convincing complaint. We may have things that our justice system has to recognize and be sympathetic with and, and uh, assist in every way possible so that the truth will ultimately prevail. But until the truth pursuant to our justice system is determined, uh, what we have is simply an accusation. I don't think that Laskin went any further than that, nor did he ever suggest that criminal liability ought to be based uh, totally on uh, a reasonable person uh, standard. Uh, I, I, I hope that's responsive to your question. Thank you very much. We can take another one over here. 
Um, I'm a person who's referred to as a 1L, oh. even though my appearance might uh, indicate that to the contrary. And here at Bore Alaskan, I have learned much more than I knew before about the indigenous approach to justice. And I found it very hard to comprehend what you were saying about an adversarial approach and how it could be, how it could accommodate an indigenous approach to justice. Because as far as I understand it, an indigenous approach to justice has nothing to do with an adversarial process. It has to do with accommodation in the community, having, having the, the, the person who violated the norms of the community understand that and make restitution to, the, to, to his relatives, to the community, to being brought into harmony with the community. There is really nothing punitive or adversarial or I mean, what do I know? I'm a one L, right? No, no, no. And no. and but No, you're speaking the truth too. But but I, I see nothing in common with an adversarial process. And I just I I see more in common with you know, we could have common law and the civil code and indigenous law as three orders of law, but, but I, no. I leave it to you. Okay, no, I, 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 uh, let me clarify if I was unclear. I'm not suggesting that, that, um, uh, that indigenous law become either the law of the indigenous community or the law of the land. I agree with you that, that fundamental indigenous principles are not easily reconcilable with the adversarial process uh, even though uh, some of you may have read an article in the Globe and Mail today in which uh, Sean Fine outlined a new program at the University of Victoria, which is going to be a four-year program that incorporates uh, indigenous law along with common law principles, and it's going to be an expanded process, perhaps to do better than I can do in trying to uh, determine how you can uh, inject a uh, principles of indigenous law into the adversarial process. But we have done that. You see, we, we actually have. In other words, to say that we, I, I agree with you on the burden of proof and how we go about the process of determining guilt or innocence or responsibility more than guilt or innocence. The, the process for determining responsibility is different. The, the after effect of responsibility is different. Uh, I appreciate that completely. But what we have done, and we've actually, it, it, the only community mentioned in the criminal code is the indigenous community on Gladue principles. We actually have articulate, articulated Gladue principles as uh, part of a mandatory consideration of what we do in terms of a determination of punishment. And we have to include as part of that notion of punishment uh, a consideration of, of the oppression of indigenous peoples in this country, the overrepresentation, the absurd overrepresentation of the indigenous community in our prison population, uh, the failure of our community to be able to respond effectively uh, in terms of bail and other issues uh, to indigenous needs within our community. All of those features become part of what I called uh, addressing the sharp edges of the adversarial process. How do we incorporate it? We're not suggesting we incorporate it by anything revolutionary. I'm saying that, that there are features of the adversarial system which can learn from indigenous justice and may be somehow approached in a way that is more responsive to indigenous needs. But again, if we're, and I appreciate the indigenous community is very distinct from other cultural minorities in Canada. Right? But as an example, right, there are within our broader community, 
As I said, 5% of, of our community is now South Asian. 5% of our community is Chinese. Uh, th th those communities are, from a population perspective only, not from an historical perspective at all, but from a population perspective, they're larger than the indigenous community today in this country. From a matter of statistics, are we to incorporate uh, some aspect of the manner in which uh, guilt or innocence is determined under Sharia law uh, in the Muslim world? Are we to determine uh, to some extent how other cultures make a determination of guilt or innocence? My view is we ought not to, that we ought to have a national standard that is responsive to the extent possible to be sensitive to those separate communities. And I appreciate much more so to the indigenous community than to, uh, to other cultures because it's the founding nation. It's the founding culture of, of, of our nation. And the responsiveness to indig indigenous needs is a far higher priority uh, in what we ought to do. But um, I, I hope that, I, I don't want to leave the impression that I'm, I'm advocating some synthesis of two quite competing justice systems. What I'm saying is there are ways in which we can just soften the sharp edges of, of the adversarial process by incorporating a better understanding uh, in terms of where it can at least respond uh, to indigenous needs. So I'd like to wrap up the night. Uh, we have a gift to provide to Mr. Greenspan to thank him on behalf of Lakehead University and the Faculty of Law for a very interesting and, and uh, well-delivered talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Greenspan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please join us in the library. We do have some light refreshments and uh, you are all welcome to attend. We also have an unveiling of a, a special space that we will be doing in uh, just a few moments. Thank you. Thank you.